Chapter Twelve The Fight Beyond the door, Howland heard Jean pause. There followed a few moments' silence, as though the other were listening for sound within. Then there came a fumbling at the bar, and the door swung inward. "'Bonjour, monsieur,' called Jean's cheerful voice as he stepped inside. "'Is it possible you are not up, with all this dog barking and—' His eyes had gone to the empty bunk. Despite his cheerful greeting, Howland saw that the Frenchman's face was haggard and pale as he turned quickly toward him. He observed no further than that, but flung his whole weight on the unprepared croisset, and together they crashed to the floor. There was scarce a struggle, and Jean lay still. He was flat on his back, his arms pinioned to his sides, and bringing himself astride the Frenchman's body, so that each knee imprisoned an arm, Howland coolly began looping the babiche thongs that he had snatched from the table as he sprang to the door. Behind Howland's back, Jean's legs shot suddenly upward. In a quick, choking clutch of steel-like muscle, they gripped about his neck like powerful arms, and in another instant he was twisted backward with a force that sent him half-neck-broken to the opposite wall. He staggered to his feet, dazed for a moment, and Jean Croisset stood in the middle of the floor, his caribou-skin coat thrown off, his hands clenched, his eyes darkening with a dangerous fire. As quickly as it had come, the fire died away, and as he advanced slowly, his shoulders hunched over, his white teeth gleamed in a smile. Howland smiled back and advanced to meet him. There was no humor, no friendliness in the smiles. Both had seen that flash of teeth and deadly scintillation of eyes at other times. Both knew what it meant. "'I believe that I will kill you, monsieur,' said Jean softly. There was no excitement, no tremble of passion in his voice. "'I have been thinking that I ought to kill you. I almost made up my mind to kill you when I came back to this Maison de Mort Rouge. It is the justice of God that I kill you.' The two men circled, like beasts in a pit, Howland in the attitude of a boxer, Jean, with his shoulders bent, his arms slightly curved at his side, the toes of his moccasined feet bearing his weight. Suddenly he launched himself at the other's throat. In a flash Howland stepped a little to one side and shot out a crashing blow that caught Jean on the side of the head and sent him flat on his back. Half stunned, Croisset came to his feet. It was the first time that he had ever come into contact with science. He was puzzled. His head rang, and for a few moments he was dizzy. He darted in again, in his old, quick, cat-like way, and received a blow that dazed him. This time he kept his feet. "'I am sure now that I am going to kill you, monsieur,' he said as coolly as before. There was something terribly calm and decisive in his voice. He was not excited. He was not afraid. His fingers did not go near the weapons in his belt, and slowly the smile faded from Howland's lips as Jean circled about him. He had never fought a man of this kind. Never had he looked on the appalling confidence that was in his antagonist's eyes. From those eyes, rather than from the man, he found himself slowly retreating. They followed him, never taking themselves from his face. In them the fire returned and grew deeper. Two dull red spots began to glow in Croisset's cheeks, and he laughed softly when he suddenly leaped in so that Howland struck at him and missed. He knew what to expect now, and Howland knew what to expect. It was the science of one world pitted against that of another, the science of civilization against that of the wilderness. Howland was trained in his art. 
For sport, Jean had played with wounded lynx. His was the quickness of sight, of instinct, the quickness of the great north loon that had often played this same game with his rifle fire, of the sledge dog whose ripping fangs carried death so quickly that eyes could not follow. A third and a fourth time he came within distance, and Howland struck and missed. "'I am going to kill you,' he said again. To this point Howland had remained cool. Self-possession in his science he knew to be half the battle. But he felt in him now a slow, swelling anger. The smiling flash in Jean's eyes began to irritate him. The fearless, taunting gleam of his teeth, his audacious confidence, put him on edge. Twice again he struck out swiftly, but Jean had come and gone like a dart. His lithe body, fifty pounds lighter than Howland's, seemed to be that of a boy dodging him in some tantalizing sport. The Frenchman made no effort at attack. His were the tactics of the wolf at the heels of the bull moose, of the lynx before the prongs of a cornered buck, tiring, worrying, ceaseless. Howland's striking muscles began to ache, and his breath was growing shorter with the exertions which seemed to have no effect on Coisset. For a few moments he took the aggressive, rushing Jean to the stove, behind the table, twice around the room, striving vainly to drive him into a corner, to reach him with one of the sweeping blows which Coisset evaded with the lightning quickness of a hell-diver. When he stopped, his breath came in wind-broken gasps. Jean drew nearer, smiling, ferociously cool. "'I am going to kill you, monsieur,' he repeated again. Howland dropped his arms, his fingers relaxed, and he forced his breath between his lips as if he were on the point of exhaustion. There were still a few tricks in his science, and these he knew were about his last cards. He backed into a corner, and Jean followed, his eyes flashing a steely light his body growing more and more tense. "'Now, monsieur, I am going to kill you,' he said in the same low voice. "'I am going to break your neck.' Howland backed against the wall, partly turned as if fearing the other's attack, and yet without strength to repel it. There was a contemptuous smile on Coisset's lips as he poised himself for an instant, then he leaped in, and as his fingers gripped at the other's throat, Howland's right arm shot upward in a deadly short-arm punch that caught his antagonist under the jaw. Without a sound, Jean staggered back, tottered for a moment on his feet, and fell to the floor. Fifty seconds later, he opened his eyes to find his hands bound behind his back and Howland standing at his feet. "'Mon Dieu! But that was a good one!' he gasped, after he had taken a long breath or two. "'Will you teach it to me, monsieur?' "'Get up,' commanded Howland. "'I have no time to waste, Coisset.' He caught the Frenchman by the shoulders and helped him to a chair near the table. Then he took possession of the other's weapons, including the revolver which Jean had taken from him, and began to dress. He spoke no word until he was done. "'Do you understand what is going to happen, Coisset?' he cried then, his eyes blazing hotly. "'Do you understand that what you have done will put you behind prison bars for ten years or more? Does it dawn on you that I'm going to take you back to the authorities, and that as soon as we reach the Wakusko, I'll have twenty men back on the trail of these friends of yours. A gray pallor spread itself over Jean's thin face. The great God, monsieur, you cannot do that. Cannot? Howland's fingers dug into the edge of the table. By this great God of yours, Coisset, but I will. And why not? 
Is it because Melisse is among this gang of cutthroats and murderers? Pish, my dear Jean, you must be a fool. They tried to kill me on the trail, tried it again in the coyote, and you came back here determined to kill me. You've held the whip hand from the first. Now it's mine. I swear that if I take you back to the Wakusko, we'll get you all. If, monsieur? Yes, if. And that if... Jean was straining against the table. It rests with you, Croisset. I will bargain with you. Either I shall take you back to the Wakusko, hand you over to the authorities, and send a force after the others, or you shall take me to Melisse. Which shall it be? And if I take you to Melisse, monsieur? Howland straightened, his voice trembling a little with excitement. If you take me to Melisse and swear to do as I say, I shall bring no harm to you or your friends. And Melisse? Jean's eyes darkened again. You will not harm her, monsieur? Harm her? There was a laughing tremor in Howland's voice. Good God, man, are you so blind that you can't see that I am doing this because of her? I tell you that I love her, and that I am willing to die in fighting for her. Until now I haven't had the chance. You and your friends have played a cowardly underhand game, Quasset. You have taken me from behind at every move, and now it's up to you to square yourself a little, or there's going to be hell to pay. Understand? You take me to Melisse, or there'll be a clean-up that will put you and the whole bunch out of business. Harm her. Again Howland laughed, leaning his white face toward Jean. Come, which shall it be, Croisset? A cold glitter, like the snap of sparks from striking steels, shot from the Frenchman's eyes. The grayish pallor went from his face. His teeth gleamed in the enigmatic smile that had half undone Howland in the fight. "'You are mistaken in some things, monsieur,' he said quietly. "'Until today I have fought for you and not against you. But now you have left me but one choice. I will take you to Melisse, and that means—' "'Good!' cried Howland. La, la, monsieur, not so good as you think. It means that as surely as the dogs carry us there, you will never come back. Mon Dieu, your death is certain. Howland turned briskly to the stove. Hungry, Jean? he asked more companionably. Let's not quarrel, man. You've had your fun, and now I'm going to have mine. Have you had breakfast? "'I was anticipating that pleasure with you, monsieur,' replied Jean, with grim humor. "'And then, after I had fed you, you were going to kill me, my dear Jean,' laughed Howland, flopping a huge caribou steak on the naked top of the sheet-iron stove. "'Real nice fellow you are, huh?' "'You ought to be killed, monsieur.' "'So you've said before.' When I see Melisse, I'm going to know the reason why, or... Or what, monsieur? Kill you, Jean. I've just about made up my mind that you ought to be killed. If anyone dies up here where we're going, Croisset, it will be you, first of all. Jean remained silent. A few minutes later Howland brought the caribou steak, a dish of flour cakes, and a big pot of coffee to the table. Then he went behind Jean and untied his hands. When he sat down at his own side of the table, he cocked his revolver and placed it beside his tin plate. Jean grimaced and shrugged his shoulders. "'It means business,' said his captor warningly. "'If at any time I think you deserve it, I shall shoot you in your tracks, Croisset.' 
so don't arouse my suspicions. I took your word of honor, said Jean sarcastically. And I will take yours to an extent, replied Howland, pouring the coffee. Suddenly he picked up the revolver. You never saw me shoot, did you? See that cup over there? He pointed to a small tin pack cup hanging to a nail on the wall a dozen paces from them. Three times without missing, he drove bullets through it and smiled across at Croisset. "'I am going to give you the use of your arms and legs, except at night,' he said. "'Mon Dieu, it is safe,' grunted Jean. "'I give you my word that I will be good, monsieur.' The sun was up when Croisset led the way outside. His dogs and sledge were a hundred yards from the building, and Howland's first move was to take possession of the Frenchman's rifle and eject the cartridges, while Jean tossed chunks of caribou flesh to the huskies. When they were ready to start, Jean turned slowly and half reached out a mittened hand to the engineer. Monsieur, he said softly, I cannot help liking you, though I know that I should have killed you long ago. I tell you again that if you go into the north, there is only one chance in a hundred that you will come back alive. Great God, monsieur, up where you wish to go, the very trees will fall on you, and the carrion ravens pick out your eyes. And that chance... That one chance in a hundred, monsieur. I will take, interrupted Howland decisively. I was going to say, monsieur, finished Jean quietly, that unless accident has befallen those who left Wakusko yesterday, that one chance is gone. If you go south, you are safe. If you go into the north, you are no better than a dead man. "'There will at least be a little fun at the finish,' laughed the young engineer. "'Come, Jean, hit up the dogs.' "'Mon Dieu, I say you are a fool and a brave man,' said Croisset, and his whip twisted sinuously in mid-air and cracked in sharp command over the yellow backs of the huskies. End of chapter 12 Recording by Roger Moline